December 13th, 2001. Biography with Harry Smith. Sammy and Dean, Peter, Joey, and of course, Frank Sinatra. They were the hottest ticket in town, and you're invited to the party. Welcome to Biography's two-part look at the legendary Las Vegas showman known as the Rat Pack. At the end of the 1950s, Americans went looking for thrills, and nobody provided thrills like the Rat Pack. On the silver screen, they created magic. In the tabloids, they created scandal. But it was on the stages of the Sands Hotel in Las Vegas that they created a legend. There were five mortal men to whom we gave immortality. Throughout the decade of the 1960s, they worked their special magic on us and left us spellbound. They made the squares feel hip, and even the cool cats were warmed by their presence. I'd like to introduce my bookmaker. He's way in the back there. They helped put an end to racial segregation in America by laughing bigotry out of existence. Hey, if all the women in Texas were as ugly as your mama, the Lone Ranger's gonna be alone for a long time, yeah! Like Pied Pipers, they led us out of the doldrums of the 1950s into the new frontier of a young president. Five men who never even finished high school taught us that talent could overcome every disadvantage. In return, we gave them a license to break all of the rules we had to follow, spend all of the money we would never earn, party all night with the beautiful broads, and sleep late every morning. Live for us, we said. Live the lives we would live if we were talented, rich, and handsome. Be outrageous. Because of you, the world is no longer a dreary place. I beg your pardon. Did you see two gentlemen go past here? No, but you'll do. <laughs> <laughs> The press tagged them the Rat Pack, and the name stuck. Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., Peter Lawford, Joey Bishop, and the man who put it all together, Frank Sinatra, threw us a party that lasted 10 years. And there hasn't been one like it since. I'm out of money, bro. You'll go there by yourself, I know that. <laughs> leader or no leader, I ain't going with you, baby. You've been playing pot games with my sister. You've been fooling around with my sister and you ain't been paying, is that right? Mm -hmm. Need the money on a dress, Mr. Tonight, we revisit the glory days of Frank Sinatra and the Rat Pack, a time in our history that many of us would like to get back to if we could just find a roadmap. Well, I guess that's it, folks. Hollywood, California, 1950. The story of the Rat Pack begins here, at the home of legendary actor Humphrey Bogart. Nearly every night, Bogey, the king of the movie Tough Guys, would invite a select group of friends over to drink and talk shop. Top stars like Judy Garland, Spencer Tracy, Katherine Hepburn, David Niven, and director John Huston were regulars. As the evenings wore on, the conversation invariably turned to the same ugly subject, the tyranny of the studio system. Back then, virtually every actor, director, and writer worked on the contract to one of the major studios. If they wanted to keep their jobs, 
They were expected to take their assignments without question. The arrogance of studio bosses like Louis B. Mayer and Jack Warner infuriated Bogart, who was determined to call his own shots. Bogart and his friends began handing scripts back and demanding an active role in their own careers. Out of frustration, the studio bosses named them the Rat Pack. Bogart selected as president of the Rat Pack a young man whom he considered to have all of the attributes of a leader. Fearlessness, unbridled ego, and above all, supreme talent. His name was Frank Sinatra. Bogart was the founder and he was the leader, obviously, even though Frank was Mr. President. And I think that this idea of defiance, of being the rebel, of being different, Frank really accepted into his conscious behavior. That became his, his way of life. And he, obviously, from, from bogey, you know, to defy, to be different, to tell somebody to go to hell, to, to tell somebody, you know, to be your own boss. You don't take orders, you give orders. The irony was not lost on Frank Sinatra that a celluloid gangster should offer him the same advice he had been given a dozen years before by the genuine article. Paul Skinny D'Amato was born in Atlantic City, New Jersey in 1909. Skinny started gambling at 10 years of age. He had crap games on corners, empty houses, school yards, and he made the money because he had the dice and the cards. So finally, when he became older, his uncle lent him $40 to open up this cigar store, and that's how he started. They had a pool room in the back, and they had gambling. The, the cigar store was just a front. But he had many cigar stores and joints. At 16 years old, he had about 15 places all over Atlantic City. He was really an entrepreneur at an early age. He catered to pickpockets, thieves, gamblers, prostitutes, madams, you name them. So, and the mob. So they said to him, why, why do you cater to the mob? He says, I don't ask favors from them. He says, besides, it's like having the United States Army behind you. Before there was a Las Vegas, there was Atlantic City, America's first playground. By day, Atlantic City was the clean, fun capital of America. A haven of sun, surf, and saltwater taffy. Its world-famous boardwalk was the stage for countless parades and beauty contests including the annual Miss America pageant. Swarms of tourists scrambled over each other just to get a good look at the latest outrageous attraction. Men box kangaroos and lost. Cats boxed each other with gloves in a miniature ring. A woman dove off a 40-foot tower into a water tank on horseback. But after the sun went down, Atlantic City shed its mantle of innocence and went out to raise a little hell. On Kentucky and Missouri Avenues, nightclubs, bars, and restaurants offered the best in food drink, and entertainment. In 1939, 24-year-old Frank Sinatra came to Atlantic City for the first time to play the Steel Pier Casino with the Harry James Band. By then, Skinny D'Amato, a born showman with a keen eye for talent, 
had fought his way up from the streets to become manager and part owner of the most popular spot in town, the 500 Club. Sinatra used to perform at the Steel Pier, and then he'd come in the club sometimes with Harry James, and, and Betty Grable would be there too. But uh, Sinatra was very nice, well-mannered, pleasant to everyone. And when he, he'd ask for a drink, or food, and Skinny said, um, I have something to tell you. Important men do not ask. They order. So Skinny sort of molded his character, Sinatra's character, how to behave. A friendship developed between Skinny D'Amato and Frank Sinatra that would last a lifetime. It was the kind of loyalty that Frank would never receive from anyone in Hollywood or the music industry, and certainly not from the press. In December of 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, and the United States ended World War II. What lay ahead were four long, bitter, and painful years. How and why Frank Sinatra came to be the one to see America through them can be explained in only one way. He answered a need in all of us. Whenever Sinatra sang to an audience, he literally bared his soul. No popular singer had ever before brought that kind of emotional intensity to a live performance. Throughout the lonely days and nights of World War II, while American GIs were fighting overseas, their sweethearts flocked to hear Frank Sinatra, who touched them as no one else could. He gave voice to their disappointments, as well as to their sense of life's impermanence and fragility. His genius for interpretation and phrasing, and above all, his overwhelming charisma, bonded his fans to him to the point of obsession. America had launched its first superstar. When I knew that Sinatra was in town, I would sneak in the back with all the girls running. I would be the only guy in the middle running into the Paramount Theater to get in for nothing. there and I didn't understand because I was a young kid what they were screaming at. I couldn't hear his voice that well and uh, you look I said what skinny kid why? I couldn't believe it why? I thought they were sorry because he was skinny that maybe he didn't have a sandwich maybe he didn't eat this guy and I'm saying maybe there's something wrong because he he didn't he was not an attractive man in those days his his, his jaw was sunken in the girls were screaming, Frankie, we love you, Frankie, we love you. They went on and on. And I went, wow, is that show business? Maybe they got to like you because you're skinny and you look depressed and the girls want to help you. Everybody wants to mother him. I think that might have been maybe a fact they want to mother him. I said, gee, this guy needs a dish of macaroni for crying out loud. I thought it was a terrible thing that maybe they were abusing this guy. But he just stood there, he had his hands like this here in the mic, and he was singing, you know, long ago and far, whatever the heck he was saying, all or nothing at all. And they would sing his Frankie, Frankie, baby, Frankie, baby, and I'm going, what? For Frank Sinatra, the war years proved to be the best of times. Rejected for military service due to a punctured eardrum, he was free to remain stateside, earning huge sums of money. While his millions of fans were forced to count ration stamps and wait online for hours to buy food and gasoline,
Sinatra enjoy the life of a family man. He bought his wife Nancy a beautiful home in New Jersey and showered gifts on his firstborn child, Nancy, the true love of his life. The Sinatras wanted for nothing. They even drove their own Chrysler convertible. But nobody seemed to care. In a country that had lost its men, Frank Sinatra filled the void. He was every woman's man. In 1941, Frank Sinatra was headlining with the Tommy Dorsey Band at the Michigan Theater in Detroit. On the same show, opening for the Dorsey Band, was a black song and dance act called the Will Maston Trio, featuring a 16-year-old spark plug named Little Sammy. I'm going. I'm going. I'm going. I'm going. Sammy Davis had been performing with his dad and his uncle for more than 13 years. In his autobiography, Davis recalled his first meeting with Frank Sinatra in the following words. He came up to me backstage and he said, Hi, I'm Frank and I sing with the Dorsey Band. Sammy Davis began his show business career at the tender age of three. By the time he was six, Sammy was already a top vaudeville star, making good money, money that his dad and his uncle, Will Maston, didn't want to give up. Instead of sending him home to live with his mother and go to school, they kept Sammy on the road with them. One time uh, I met them backstage, and Will Maston said to him, said to Sammy, and he was little, and said to Sammy, this is your mother. And he looked up at Will and said, I have a new mother every week. Sammy never spent a single day in school, but he learned his craft from the most gifted and accomplished entertainers of the day. By the time he ran into Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis was a seasoned professional who had toured America from coast to coast 23 times. Sammy thought he'd seen every great performer there was to see until he heard Frank Sinatra sing for the first time that night at the Detroit Theater. Sammy Davis had never heard anything like it. Saturday night is the loneliest night of the week. I sing the song that I sang for the memories I usually see Until I hear you at the door Until you're in my arms once more Saturday night is the loneliest night of the week He's got feeling. He puts the feeling in on it. It makes the lyrics mean something. See, some singers ride the beat. Others lay off the beat. He can do either way. He can go one, two, three, four. When I was in heaven, now the guy said, when I was in heaven, but Sinatra give you that thing, you know, that little phrasing. He's got the phrasing. Frank Sinatra was equally impressed with Sammy Davis. In 1947, shortly after Sammy was honorably discharged from the Army, Sinatra chose the Will Maston Trio to open for him at New York's Capitol Theater for $1,250 a week. 
There was more money than we had ever seen in our lives, Sammy would later comment. Sinatra knew the kid was talented, and he he saw in the future. See, he says, now this guy's going to be going to be great one of these days. So he defended him. You know, a guy like to feel like I discovered something. I saw a gem in, the, in this rough cut thing I saw in the, found in the desert or wherever it was, you know. Of all the top white performers, only Frank Sinatra had the guts to challenge the bald-faced racism that sought to keep Davis buried on the Chitlin circuit and out of the big time. Nobody but Frank Sinatra could have put Sammy Davis where he was, uh, where he was. Frank Sinatra, first of all, was never a racist kind of a guy. He cared about everybody being equal. Frank Sinatra put the holy roly on this man because Frank Sinatra knew this is a great talent. And in order for this man to present it to the American public with all the racism going on, when Frank said, this guy is great, they all paid attention. Thus began Sammy Davis's rise to stardom. From then on, Frank Sinatra would be at his side every step of the way ready to go to the wall for his body, whom he lovingly nicknamed Smokey. In 1944, Frank Sinatra signed a motion picture contract with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studios and moved his growing family to Hollywood. Shortly after joining MGM, Sinatra was invited to a party at the home of studio head Louis B. Mayer. It was there that he met a handsome young actor named Peter Lawford. Sinatra and Lawford were the only two young guys at the party and took an instant liking to each other. At 29, Frank Sinatra was looking forward to a career as a dramatic actor at a major studio. 21-year-old Peter Lawford, however, had been under contract at MGM for two years and was well on his way to becoming a leading man. When Frank came to MGM, I think, well, certainly in the beginning, that Peter was, was a bigger star than Frank. A free spirit who spent most of his time at the beach Lawford would always be regarded as something of an oddball by the Hollywood community. Peter Lawford was born in 1923, the illegitimate child of Sir Sidney Lawford and Mrs. May Allen, the wife of one of his staff officers. The scandal eventually forced the Lawfords to leave England. For most of his childhood, Peter lived a nomadic life, traveling about Europe and the Far East with his parents. Eventually, they settled in Palm Beach, Florida, as house guests of the American Nouveau Riche, who were eager to show off their blue blood English guests. But by 1939, Lord and Lady Lawford had worn out their welcome and lost all of their money. Cast aside by their society friends, they moved into a shabby rented bungalow on the wrong side of the tracks in West Palm Beach. At 16 years of age, Peter Lawford should have been a junior in high school. Instead, he became the family breadwinner, parking cars at a local garage for $25 a week. While on the job, Peter, who was totally naive to American racism, struck up a close friendship with his two co-workers, both of whom were black. One day, a wealthy client saw Peter sitting under a tree with his new buddies, eating sandwiches and playing cards. Outraged, he complained to the parking lot owner that it was a disgrace to see a good-looking white boy fraternizing with two coloreds. Lufford was almost fired. That man was Joseph P. Kennedy. Fifteen years later, Kennedy would become Peter Lawford's father-in-law. In 1942, May Lawford borrowed some money from a friend 
and moved the family to Hollywood in the hope of getting her handsome son into the movies. Luckily for Peter, most of Hollywood's leading young actors were away, fighting in World War II. Louis B. Mayer, realizing the need for English actors for his studio's wartime movies, took one look at Peter Lawford and immediately signed him to a contract with MGM. May Lawford was determined to control her son's career. When MGM rejected her demand that she be hired as Peter's manager, she went directly to Louis B. Mayer and told him that her son was a homosexual who needed supervision. Peter was a victim of his mother who wanted to be, really be, Lady Lawford. Peter definitely had a certain, quote, something. He was very popular in terms of fan mail and all of that. And he was a, a, a doggone good actor. And he, he brought a Cary Grant kind of, of, of suaveness uh, uh, to his, his roles. By the time Frank Sinatra reported for work at MGM, Peter Lawford was receiving thousands of fan letters each week. Because he disguised it so well, Lawford's fans never noticed that he had a deformed right arm, the result of a childhood accident. What happened? Like Sinatra, Lawford was also 4F, but he often played the part of a soldier. During World War II, Peter Lawford served in the private army of Louis B. Mayer. Laddie, you get bigger, but you never grow up. He flew countless missions over enemy territory without ever leaving the ground. With Lassie as his co-pilot, Lawford fought the good fight on the MGM backlot. Uncle Sam had drafted most of MGM's young actors, leaving the studio filled with an abundance of available young actresses. Peter Lawford and Frank Sinatra were like kids in a candy store. Lawford was a bachelor, but Sinatra was very much married. Still, he didn't let that interfere with his romantic pursuits. After a long day in a set, Sinatra and Lawford often made the rounds of the best Hollywood nightclubs in the company of MGM's most beautiful women. In 1946, Peter Lawford was in the midst of a torrid love affair with a sultry actress named Ava Gardner. Ava was in my book a true beauty. Ava would come in in a shirtwaist and skirt and no stockings, kick off the shoes. The feet were as beautiful as every other part of her. In his early years at MGM, Frank Sinatra hardly noticed Ava Gardner, embroiled as he was with Hollywood's reigning queen, Lana Turner. Lana Turner was signed to MGM. That's where I first taught Lana to walk down the stairs in Ziegfeld Girl. Then I took her on the set where she was going to walk down those stairs, and nobody ever did it greater than she did. Three years earlier, Lana Turner had broken Lawford's heart when she abruptly ended their romance. Now, the shoe was on the other foot. Frank Sinatra would dump Lana Turner after she insisted he divorce his wife, Nancy, and marry her. I can see a steeple surrounded by people. In 1946, Frank Sinatra and Peter Lawford 
made their first film together. It happened in Brooklyn. Sinatra expected great things from the picture. Already the most popular singer in America, he had been given a dramatic lead opposite Catherine Grayson, one of MGM's top stars. You're not my coming in after midnight, do you? Oh, of course not. Good night, Danny. It's, it's been a wonderful evening. Gee, I guess we're going steady now, huh, hey? <laughs> His co-star, veteran showman Jimmy Durante, christened him Moonlight Sinatra. At the start of production, Peter Lawford was to have only a small speaking part. You know, we gotta start rounding up a doll for you. A doll? A chick. Or as they was known in my youth, a sweet patootie. Spending all my money for But at the last minute, the director, hearing that Lofa did a mean jitterbug, gave him a dance number in the film. You say you look too swell to be seen with me. When the picture was released, the LA Times gave Frank Sinatra lukewarm reviews for his acting, while Peter Lofford's dance routine was hailed as a showstopper. I think maybe people forget uh, at that time. Um, how important he was. He really was a big star. He was the, uh, the y leading young man at MGM. In 1948, Collier's magazine named Peter Lawford the most popular romantic lead in the movies. But behind the perfect face and debonair manner, Lawford was a man tormented by feelings of profound inadequacy. Unable to free himself from the chains of his parents' disgrace and the loss of a legitimate heritage, Peter Lawford would always be haunted by the demons of his childhood. To me, that is the sadness because Peter could have been what we call a really terrific leading man. In that same year of 1948, Frank Sinatra fell madly in love with Ava Gardner. At that point, he distanced himself from Peter Lawford. For the next 20 years, their relationship would always be a raging storm, filled with battles over women, money, and power. In July of 1946, Frank Sinatra was just settling into his new life in Tinseltown. Back in Atlantic City, Frank's old pal, Skinny D'Amato, was about to give another Italian singer the biggest break of his life. 28-year-old Dean Martin had been crooning his way around the nightclub circuit for 10 lackluster years. A tough kid from a tough neighborhood in Steubenville, Ohio, Dean Martin first aspired to become a prize fighter, then a professional gambler, and after that, even a gangster. Dean was a familiar face to patrons of the less exclusive clubs in Times Square, where he'd be found most nights hustling gigs or hanging out with other performers, all waiting for their big break. Back then, his best friend and roommate was singer Sonny King. Dean Martin and I lived together for five and a half years at a place called the Bryant Hotel. In fact, they have a plaque, 616. We lived in room 616, and they said, this room was occupied by Dean Martin and Sonny King, who never paid the rent. We were both amateur fighters, boxers, you know, and we used to charge people five dollars a piece, come and watch us fight up in the room. We'd get about 10 guys for 50 bucks. Dean had just had his nose fixed. So I hit him a shot in the ribs, and he, uh -uh. so the guy, bong, he made believe he had the end of the round. As I turned around, Dean gave me a shot in the back of the neck 
and the shoulder blades, and I went flying out the window, six floors up. Luckily, they were the old-fashioned shades. They were made out of iron. The blinds, the Venetian blinds, and I hung on to the Venetian blinds, and Dean was laughing, you know? Kind-hearted Dean. He was laughing like hell, you know? And they finally pulled me up, but they scraped my whole chest coming up, and I was bleeding. And I tell you, I beat the hell out of him. So much so that the next week, he was supposed to open up the Hippodrome Theater in Baltimore, and I went in for him under the name of Dean Martin. But I couldn't sing in his keys because he was a baritone and I was a tenor. But uh, I got fired. In the spring of 1946, Sonny King introduced Dean Martin to a 19-year-old Jewish comic named Jerry Lewis. Dean and I were walking along the street one day, and it was simple, nothing dramatic, you know. It was a simple thing, and Jerry, hi, Sonny. Jerry always loved Dean Martin from afar, you know, he didn't know him personally. And I knew he wanted to meet Dean. So, come here, Jerry. Jerry, this is Dean. Dean, this is Jerry Lewis. Hi, how you doing? Okay, how you doing? Good. Come on, join us. We're going to have a cup of coffee. And from then on, the rest was history. In July, Dean Martin arrived in Atlantic City to play a one-week engagement at Skinny D'Amato's 500 Club. By sheer coincidence, Jerry Lewis had been working at the 500 Club for a week before Dean Martin arrived, but his act had not gone over well. His entire show was nothing more than an old vaudeville routine, commonly known as the record act. Skinny D'Amato's partner, Irvin Wolf, found Lewis's wild gyrations and the sheer volume of his records so irritating that he could barely stand to sit in the club when Lewis was performing. Wolfie, he used to drink a bottle of King William the Fourth every night, but boy, he used, he he didn't like Jerry Lewis at all. By the time Dean Martin took the stage at the Five Hundred Club, Skinny D'Amato had handed Jerry Lewis his walking papers. Jerry was backstage packing his things, going back, and Dean was going to be the new star. And all of a sudden, they heard a crash of the platters and things like that. So Jerry, Dean Martin, who was very fast, said, I guess Jerry's packing all his records. <laughs> you know? And Jerry heard that. And through anger, sometimes you can become funny. And he walked out, I don't think that's very nice, Dean, you know. And the people started to laugh. In spite of themselves, Dean and Jerry had stumbled across a routine that brought roars of laughter. Skinny D'Amato's instincts immediately took over, and he seized the moment. Skinny, I think it was, said, Hey, you two guys get together here. You don't know what the hell you're doing. If you don't like it, get out. And they got together, and they got squirting soda at one another, and blah, 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 and that's where they met, and that's how it happened. And before you know it, they had an act the next night. Do you know what they wrote it on? A paper bag, a brown paper bag. They wrote the act. Skinny D'Amato made Dean and Jerry a hit at Atlantic City. As individuals, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis had never been able to achieve success. As a team, they were a phenomenon. I'd have done that record pantomime the rest of my life. I wasn't looking for anything. After the first night he was on a stage with me, I knew we had lightning in a bottle. And knew exactly what we had ahead of us. For the next few weeks, the 500 Club was filled to overflowing. Outside on Missouri Avenue, hundreds of people waited online for hours to see Dean and Jerry. I wouldn't have had any fame without Dean. I wouldn't have been there. 
He was the catalyst. He was the spine of this act. He had an infinite, infinite sense of comedy, particularly with the sense of timing he had, which was impeccable. Next door to the 500 Club was Ferrara's restaurant, a regular hangout for performers in their off hours. Dean would uh, sit off at the end of the bar with my girlfriend, and they would just talk and have a few drinks. He always had a smile on his face. He was always a happy-go-lucky looking fella and a handsome-looking man. And uh, I mean, he was good-looking. He was good-looking. <laughs> and he was always well-dressed. You never saw him, you know, like some guys do real ruggedy looking. He was always well dressed and uh, always soft spoken, never voiceless, never loud. Jerry was younger, and I think Jerry followed him around because I think it was an idol for him, really, seriously. I think Jerry really saw this man as, a, as an idol, and I think it was a brother idol he saw in him. And for some reason or other, it was. Lewis went forward with, Gene, uh, with uh, Dean all the time, you know, always pushing himself with Dean, always pushing himself. And Dean, I guess because he was older, figured, hey, I don't need this, you know. And he would shy away from him, but I don't think Lewis was the kind that was going to shy away from him. Early in 1948, Skinny D'Amato, eager to show off his protégés, brought Frank Sinatra to the Copacabana in New York City, where Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, now the toast of the town, were holding court. Frank joined Jackie Gleason and Fat Jackie Leonard, two giants of the Manhattan comedy scene. And with Jerry Lewis as head wacko, the five then proceeded to bring the house down. Still the most popular entertainer in America, and for the fifth year in a row, the top male vocalist on the downbeat charts, Sinatra, dazzled everyone in the room that night. Everyone, that is, except Dean Martin. Frank was fascinated by Dean's arrogance. He was fascinated by Dean's arrogance. He never realized who Frank Sinatra was all his life. He never realized, you know, that Frank was his older brother and his mentor. And, uh, but Dean never thought of anybody like that. Dean was only two years younger than Frank Sinatra. However, whereas Sinatra had achieved instant success, Martin had endured years of singing in Chinese restaurants and second-rate clubs before striking gold with Jerry Lewis. Come on, get up. Don't be shy. Come on. Within months, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis would sign a contract with Paramount Studios and move to Hollywood. For the next eight years, their movies, television shows, and nightclub appearances would break all box office records. Well, I hope you're satisfied with the way you embarrassed me. Look at the whole audience is staring at me. Stare back at them. Now, better they stare at you. Here, get off the stage and take this with you. For you my Mary. At long last, Dean Martin would be the rich and famous star he had always known he could be. Sinatra, on the other hand, was about to embark on a romantic odyssey that would ultimately be his undoing. In the end, Sinatra would lose his family, his movie and recording contracts, and the loyalty of his fans, all for the love of a woman. In 1948, Frank Sinatra began his fall from the peak of American show business when he fell in love with Ava Gardner. For the next two years, their all-consuming affair 
was the best kept secret in Hollywood. It was uh, combustion. I mean, um, as I'm sure that their passion was combustible, they were as well. Rumors of the Sinatra Gardner affair were sending shockwaves through the executive offices of Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Ava Gardner had been under contract to MGM since 1942. The studio had spent years grooming her for stardom. Her relationship with Sinatra seriously jeopardized both her career and the studio's investment. One day, one night, night. Frank Sinatra had made a lot of money for MGM singing and dancing his way through some of its most successful musicals, like Stanley Donnan and Gene Kelly's On the Town. But Frank was 35 years old. As far as MGM was concerned, his best years were behind him. In January of 1950, Sinatra officially walked out on his marriage and announced his intention to marry Ava. Almost immediately, his world began to fall apart. The first blow was delivered by the press. A small army of reporters and columnists hounded Sinatra and Gardner wherever they went, turning their romance into America's first tabloid scandal. Letters from outraged fans began pouring into the mailroom at Metro Goldwyn Mayer. MGM executives were stunned by the level of public outcry being directed against Frank and Ava. Studio head Louis Mayer told Sinatra to end his relationship with Ava immediately. When he refused, Mayer retaliated by announcing a buyout of Frank's contract a year ahead of time and sending the check directly to his wife, Nancy. Nancy Sinatra vowed that she would never give Frank a divorce. Instead, she obtained a legal separation. That same day, Frank's assets were frozen and his property seized. Frank finally broke under the pressure. On April 26, 1950, during a performance at the Copacabana in New York City, Sinatra suffered a throat hemorrhage and was forced to cancel the remainder of his engagement. He left to join Ava Gardner in Tassa del Mar, Spain, where she was working on a latest picture, Pandora and the Flying Dutchman. This is Pandora. She was bold and beautiful. But the strains being placed on their relationship were taking a heavy toll. They fought constantly. Each wanted what they wanted. I mean, um, Ava had great lust. And she was very sensual. Frank had great lusts and was very sensual. But they each were strong enough also uh, to not be owned. Now, Boulevard presents The Frank Sinatra Show. Back in the States, Sinatra tried his luck with a television series at CBS. <laughs> is this the place? This is it, pal. This is it. Why, with a little imagination and a lot of money, you can turn this place into a palace. Do you have nerve enough to call this dump a lodge? Well, let's call it a lodge dump, then. <laughs> it was canceled after only 13 weeks. You made a deal, and a deal is a deal. I found you, now you find some other poor soul. You robber, you. I'll get even with you yet. Ah, this is Hunting the lodge. Look at this furniture. Say. Do you think this thing is strong enough to hold me? 
Are you kidding? You could sit on a hammock made out of Kleenex. <laughs> Frank's record sales had been steadily falling. For the first time in seven years, Downbeat Magazine had dropped him from top male vocalist to number five. In a desperate attempt to revive his singing career, Sinatra recorded Mama Will Bark, a novelty tune with television personality Dagmar. It flopped. Then when he did that thing with Dagmar, dogs don't bark, I want to throw myself out the window. But in those days, he needed the money. In fact, the dog almost became a bigger star. Columbia Records eventually refused to renew Frank Sinatra's contract. In November of 1950, Ava Gardner began shooting Showboat, the picture that made her a star. As Julie, the biracial heroine destroyed by the bigotry of the Old South, Gardner was hailed by critics and audiences alike as the most beautiful woman in the world. Frank Sinatra watched his career continue in a free fall. Despondent and disillusioned, he headed back to the East Coast, to Atlantic City, the scene of his early glory days. Far from the Hollywood vultures and the fat cats of the record biz, Sinatra sought out the one man he knew he could count on. His old friend, Skinny D'Amato. They were two skinny friends, so I guess they had something in common <laughs> and being Italian descent. So, um, they, you know, Skinny would entertain them, take them all over and show them a good time. Yeah. And so that's uh, to boost his ego. One morning, Skinny went out to a local jewelry store and bought Sinatra a beautiful, solid gold watch. Skinny told Frank, this is to remind you, when you come back, you'll be bigger than you ever were. He felt bad for him. So that's when he gave him this beautiful watch to seal his friend, their friendship. At Skinny D'Amato's 500 Club, Frank Sinatra returned to his roots to the people for whom he had never stopped being a star. From every corner of Atlantic City, the faithful turned out in droves to welcome him back into the fold. He was Sinatra. It was like you were seeing the Messiah come to town. <laughs> That's how he was to the Italians. They went crazy for him. I mean, you saw husbands that said to their wives, don't do anything this week. We got tickets for Sinatra. Don't do this. Don't do that. We're going to see Sinatra. Whether you wanted to go or not, if you were a female. The husband says, you go, you go. I remember he was God. He'd come in a place, and my God, you couldn't, you couldn't move. They'd fight outside. Skinny had to hire six cops every night when he was there to keep the people in order, trying to fight to get in. Skinny D'Amato and the other big nightclub owners proved themselves to be Frank Sinatra's true friends during those hard years. They kept him going financially and spiritually. Frank trusted those guys. Because if a man from the racket said, you're going to work for me next week and you're going to get yourself $15,000, you can go to sleep on that. First of all, they were the bosses. They owned all the clubs. So who are you going to work for? The guy that owns a delicatessen? For nearly half a century, the bosses of the underworld had run the nightclub business in every big city in America. Just after World War II, they moved their base of operation to Nevada, the only state in the nation where gambling was legal. There, 
they built a city of nightclubs, hotels, and casinos called Las Vegas. One of the founding fathers of Las Vegas was Mo Dalitz, a former boss of the Cleveland mob. Mo Dalitz was one of the owners of the Desert Inn, the Stardust, the Frontier, the Silver Slipper, you name it, he was the boss. He was a great, great guy. Dalitz, a close friend of Skinny D'Amato, gave Frank Sinatra a contract to sing at the Desert Inn. On any given night, you could walk into the Desert Inn and hear Frank Sinatra sing a two-hour set for the price of a 50-cent Coke. The backbiters whispered that he had thrown it all away for nothing. But Frank Sinatra had gotten what he wanted, and to hell with what it had cost. While Frank Sinatra struggled to make a living singing in nightclubs, Dean Martin had become half of the hottest new comedy team in America. But we have found a feeling higher than high, my own, my only, my own. Martin and Lewis's first picture, My Friend Irma, had been a runaway smash hit. Within months, Paramount rushed out a sequel, My Friend Irma Goes West. Both films made millions. And they're even funnier than ever, with Dean Martin singing a raft of new song hits. Yours, love is yours, because... In 1949, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis were booked to appear at the Flamingo Hotel in Las Vegas. The Flamingo had started out as the folly of gangster Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. By the time he completed it in 1947, his poor planning had cost the mob millions of dollars. In retribution, the boys closed Bugsy's account permanently. Flush with their newfound wealth and fame, Dean and Jerry arrived at the Flamingo with an entourage of friends and family. Night after night, their fans packed the main showroom for a taste of the Martin and Lewis magic. More importantly, they also packed the casino. Thanks to Dean and Jerry, the Flamingo had become the cash cow of organized crime. Bugsy Siegel's successors were now enjoying a handsome return on their investment. Dean's old mob friends from Ohio, the Fischetti brothers, now had major holdings in Las Vegas. The Fischettis had given Dean his first job as a dealer in their sneak joints back east and had later sponsored him into show business. To avoid being drawn into any conflict between his old bosses and the act, Dean shrewdly left all the team's business dealings in the hands of Jerry Lewis. The line was, talk to the Jew. The whole Mafia empire was run by Jewish lawyers. Each family had their own Jewish, Jewish lawyer. So they knew what they were talking about. If I shook their hand and made a deal, they knew it was in granite. I handled the business. He played golf. It worked. But if anyone threatened me or if it looked like I was in trouble, he'd have been right there. He'd have taken care of business. He was very protective of me. Dean wasn't protective of anybody but himself. The thing that occurred was Jerry was a skinny kid. And who the hell wants to see a skinny kid get hit, you know? So Dean would step in and, 
and uh, Jerry mistook that for protectiveness. But uh, it was Dean's way of saying, I'm the boss. Is it much further? No, we're almost there. Peter Lawford was one of the first Hollywood stars to blaze a trail to Las Vegas in search of excitement and cheap thrills. In the early 1950s, Lawford was still a bachelor and had an enviable reputation as a playboy. No, oh, I don't know. I think you have to enjoy living with yourself before you have nerve to ask anyone else to. Besides, you know how I am. Well, here we are. From time to time, Peter Lawford worked in Vegas with his old MGM co-star, the great showman, Jimmy Durante. Lawford's favorite haunts in town were the cocktail lounges, where he often made the scene with rock and rollers, like Louis Prima and Keely Smith. people basically were the cab drivers, the showgirls, the waitresses, the hookers, the dealers. Those were the people that supported us. When we were working, we worked till six o'clock in the morning, till five, six, seven o'clock in the morning. Peter was just such a nice, nice man, such a uh, class, he's a class act, he really is. And I love Jimmy Durante. Jimmy Durante was the best, bar none. And Jimmy and Peter got along wonderful, and Jimmy really loved him. Peter was good on stage. He was adorable. He could sing a little bit. He could dance a little bit. And he knew a lot of interesting stories he could tell. During those early years in Vegas, no entertainer was more popular than Sammy Davis. Davis regularly headlined at the New Frontier Hotel. Night after night, the all-white audiences packed the showroom to see Sammy give them everything he had. They showed their appreciation with rounds of applause and screams of delight. But once the show was over, Sammy Davis was subjected to the same humiliations borne by all black performers who played Vegas in the 1950s. When we used to wake the, uh, in Vegas, we had to go out and sit out by the swimming pool till our next appearance. You know, they didn't have dressing rooms or nothing for us. And when we, li when we lived here, we had to go on the west side, the black side, the negro side, a place called Mrs. Shaw's to stay over there. Sammy was going through the same things. He couldn't, he had to stay over there at Miss Shaw's when he first started coming here. In 1951, Jim Crow was still very much alive in Las Vegas. Blacks were barred from every hotel and casino on the Strip. Every night after the show was over, Sammy waited in the alley behind the hotel for a taxi to take him back to the west side. From his window at Mrs. Shaw's rooming house, Sammy would gaze out into the night at the bright lights shining back at him from the strip and wonder if the day would ever come when he would be allowed to mix with his adoring fans. the glitz and glitter, the entire garish spectacle of Las Vegas was deliberately orchestrated by the mob for one purpose only, to lure gamblers into the casinos. In Las Vegas, Frank Sinatra became one of a select group of entertainers who drew customers to the casinos like a magnet. Frank brought in gamblers, Dean brought gamblers, Sammy brought gamblers, Louie and I brought gamblers, Joey Lewis brought gamblers, Patty Page. 
Jeremy Durante brought in gamblers. Sophie Tucker brought gamblers, too. The rooms couldn't pay for themselves. You've got to bring in acts that will bring in gamblers. That's what's going to pay for everything. Early in 1950, the millions of dollars pouring into the Las Vegas casinos triggered a U.S. Senate investigation. At New York's federal building, alleged overlord of gambling, Frank Costello arrives to face the senatorial gambling probe. Frank Mob bosses were paraded in front of television cameras by the Kefauver Committee on Organized Crime. Senator Toby now turns the heat on Costello. You must have in your mind some things you've done that you can speak of to your credit as an American citizen. If so, what are they? Paid by tax. I never got money from any of those fellas. None of those none fellas. None of those fellas. None of, the, uh, none none of, of these that I've been reading about or none that I knew, they never gave me anything. None of the shuddies? No. I don't even speak to the... I, I mean, I met that Charlie once or twice. I don't even talk to him. You don't like him? No. <laughs> On March 1st, 1951, Sinatra was subpoenaed by the committee. Fortunately, he was allowed to testify at a private interview in his lawyer's office at the top of Rockefeller Center at 4 o'clock in the morning. Had Sinatra been made to testify publicly on national television, it would have certainly destroyed what was left of his career. In the years to come, Frank Sinatra would be asked many times to choose between betraying his friends or being labeled a gangster. To his credit, his loyalty never wavered. He wasn't a gangster. But you know something, the mob people, they liked the guy again. He made those guys for him. If, he, if, if the wise guy knew that Frank was mad, they went, gee, can you, can you call him? I didn't, I hope, what did I do, sir? Frank, what's he? They'd have killed for this man. They'd absolutely kill for this man. On October 31st, 1951, after three torturous years of legal wrangling, Nancy Sinatra finally agreed to a divorce. The moment he received the good news, Frank immediately contacted his old friends, Skinny D'Amato and Manny Sachs head of Columbia Records, and ask them to make all the arrangements for a wedding. Less than a week later, at Manny's brother's home in Philadelphia, Frank Sinatra and Ava Gardner were married. Frank and Ava hoped that their marriage would legitimize them in the eyes of the press and earn them a certain degree of courtesy. But even on their honeymoon in Florida, they would chase down the beach and barrage with insulting questions. Ava remarked bitterly, the reporters used to ask me, how does it feel to be a homewrecker? Now they ask me, how does it feel to be the wife of a has-been? In December, one month after their marriage, Sinatra and Gardner flew to London to appear at a benefit for Prince Philip. They organized a handful of us to fly over there for the benefit. Frank, Ava, myself, Janet, a uh, handful of other people, okay? We arrived, they put us up at a, a hotel called the Washington Hotel. We are just wasted and wiped out. I mean, that's a lot of flying. And the next day they wanted a photo shoot. So we all kind of pulled ourselves together. Frank was a little slow in getting himself together. And as he came down the steps to join us with Ava, they were brutal to him, those British bums. Well, the Mr. Sinatra finally has agreed to join us. Well, welcome. Shall we get you a throne? I mean, the things they said to him, and that was when things were tough for him. Frank was always a gentleman. I gave him so many marks in those days. I mean, really, I could see how lonely he was, how desperate he was, how, and Ava extending herself and helping him during that period of time. 
Frank was really in trouble then in 51. Listen, I'll take you to the dance and then I'll take you to Coney Island. Oh, that sounds great! <laughs> Not funny, but it's cool. <laughs> And they asked me at the Morris Agency, which was handling him, would I uh, give him a shot on the Texaco show? I'll take you to Coney Island, too. Yeah, I'll take you to the beach and we'll sit on a boardwalk. Oh, that sounds nice. Yeah, well, I'll take you to the beach and we'll sit on a boardwalk. Yeah, I'll buy you a 50 cent dinner. Finally got rid of me, eh? Yeah, I told you. <laughs> and they said to me, you can have him for $2,500 a show. And I got so mad, I started to use four letter words and curse words. I said, wrong. He's a heavyweight. He's a star. He's a star. The position that he's in now, how dare you? When Francis dances with me, holy gee, I'm as gay as can be. I take her. I said, I'm giving him more than the top. I'm giving him $7,500 for one performance. Of course, if you're doing this to Sinatra, what are you going to do to me? What are you going to do to the other clients? In March of 1952, the Sinatras attended the premiere of Frank's new picture, Meet Danny Wilson. But unlike previous years, the fans weren't there. The next day, the New York World Telegram and Sun printed the awful truth. Gone on Frankie in 42, Gone in 52. That summer, the streets of Times Square had rocked with the same pandemonium that had greeted Frank Sinatra 10 years before. A new generation of teenage fanatics besieged the Paramount Theater to get a glimpse of their new heroes. Dean Martin, and Jerry Lewis. I don't think we can hear. What? During their first week at the Paramount, Martin and Lewis broke Sinatra's old box office record. Oh, how happy you are. We just want everybody to know that we're the happiest guys in the whole, whole world. Yeah, we are. It's the greatest thrill of our lives. My this... name is MacArthur. <laughs> this is unbelievable. Thanks to his partnership with Jerry Lewis, Dean's future was now rock solid. But there was already trouble in paradise. Dean was clearly the less popular half of the team. And many saw him as merely the organ grinder to Lewis's monkey. Dean didn't mind. It was better than shoveling coal in Yorkville or wherever, Victorville or wherever else it came from, you know? So, and a lot of us settled for that. You know, it was better than where we were. So what are we arguing about? In his own nonchalant style, Martin rationalized that it was a small price to pay for the fame and fortune that was now his. In the end, however, Dean would have to choose between playing second fiddle to Lewis or trying to make it on his own as a solo performer. In 1951, Sammy Davis and the Will Maston Trio got their first booking at Ciro's, Hollywood's premier nightclub. It was the turning point in Sammy's career. His presence on the stage felt like there were fans that were pushing your body against the back of your seat. And I knew I was experiencing lightning in a bottle. He stopped the show called, and it was, it was an incredible performance. The teenage wonder to whom Frank Sinatra had extended a helping hand all those years ago had finally made it to the top of the marquee. Well, what happens if that... Sammy went on to conquer the hot new medium of television, regularly guest starring on all the big variety shows. Day 
Davis was now well on his way to realizing his lifelong ambition to be the foremost tap dancer in the world. The skill with which he was able to execute the most difficult routines was unequaled. No dancer in the business could touch him. He was an excellent athlete, you know. He was perfectly balanced. He was a tiny man, but, uh, you know, he's a, an exceptional, uh, exceptional gift. When God gave me Sam, they threw away the mold. To spend one night in our rendezvous and rambo needs with you beyond my desire. I mean, who do you know that can sing, dance, play, play instruments, be funny? and then be very nice at times, you know, most of the times. Who do you know? Sammy had everything to look forward to. He could never have imagined that the nightmare of his life lay just ahead, or that Frank Sinatra would be the one to come to his rescue. In 1952, Frank Sinatra had been in a slump for nearly five years. Hollywood insiders agreed that nothing short of a miracle could resurrect his career. Ironically, it was Sinatra himself who came upon one, buried in the pages of a best-selling novel. The character of Private Angelo Maggio, the doomed Marine in James Jones' World War II drama, From Here to Eternity, seemed to have been written for Frank Sinatra. From the moment he finished reading the book, Sinatra was convinced that he had been born to play Maggio. At that point, Frank Sinatra was so far out of the loop that he didn't even have an agent. But he did have a wife who was a major star. So it fell to Ava Gardner to persuade Harry Cohn, head of Columbia Studios, to let Frank make a screen test. It's my knowledge that he offered to do it free. He didn't even want any money. But it's also my understanding that Ava made the phone call that got it. Ava had called Cohen from Africa, where she was working on the MGM safari epic, Magambo, with Clark Abel. At Columbia Studios, Frank Sinatra's screen test convinced everyone, except Harry Cohen, who told Frank he'd get back to him. With nothing else to do, Sinatra then flew to New York for a few club dates. Let me tell you what happened. My first marriage, my honeymoon, we had the room where the camel sign was, because it was the cheapest room. When you opened the window and that camel sign went, oh, smoke came into our room. So I turned around and I had said to my president, that my wife at that time, let's go see Frank Sinatra. He was in the doldrums. He was working at a place called the French Casino. Okay, we went down there. There was nobody in the room, maybe 20, 30 people. This is when he was really going through bad times. And he came out and he started to sing. And when he sang a ballad, I mean, you knew he was singing to this woman. You knew it. He had quit that night. And he went to Magambo, which was making, the guy was making Magambo, Bavango, Bavango. He got jealous because she was a clock able. And I just said, geez, what, what, what a life this guy's leading. What a life this guy's leading. Sinatra joined his wife in Africa and waited for word from Harry Cohen. You can be nice and sweet when you want to, can't you? Sitting around the set, watching Ava play love scenes with the biggest leading man in movie history, only served to reinforce Sinatra's anger and depression over the sad state of his own career.
tensions between Frank and Ava were running at a fever pitch. By the time Harry Cohn cabled Sinatra to report for work on From Here to Eternity, the Sinatra Gardner marriage was in ruins. Sinatra took the next plane to Hawaii, where From Here to Eternity was already in production. Montgomery Clift, the great method actor from New York, had a leading part in the film. Sinatra and Clift had many scenes together. They soon became fast friends and drinking buddies. Monty became obsessed with helping Sinatra perfect his role and often stayed up half the night with him, rehearsing for the next day's shoot. The hard work paid off. Frank Sinatra's performance would earn him an Oscar nomination. Sinatra's triumph had come too late. In December of 1953, Ava gave Frank the gate. The marriage had finally crumbled under the weight of her enormous successes and his bitter disappointments. A few weeks later, when the gossip columns reported that Ava Gardner and Peter Lawford had been seen out on the town together and were rekindling their romance, Sinatra went ballistic. He telephoned Lawford in California and threatened to break his legs if he ever saw Ava again. For the next six years, Frank Sinatra refused even to speak to Peter Lawford. In March of 1954, Sinatra attended the 26th Academy Awards presentation, accompanied only by his children, Nancy and Frank Jr. That night, he walked away with the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. Frank Sinatra was on his way back to the top. When he finally got there, he would remember what a lonely place it could be. This is quite a gun, Benny. Quite a gun. I did a lot of chopping in the war with a baby like this. A lot of chopping. Frank Sinatra followed up his Academy Award winning performance with a role that would come back to haunt him years later. You can't do this. You can't do it. Suddenly, Sinatra played a mentally deranged combat veteran hired to assassinate the President of the United States. I can do it, and I'm going to do it. But you're an American citizen. Sure. And one minute after five, I'm going to be a very rich American citizen. You'll never get away with it. Shut up. I got a stomach. Ache. Take a pill. Maybe the old man's right, Johnny. It's a terrible thing, a terrible thing. Turn it off, will you? Just another man, a man, with the president. Yeah, yeah, I never killed a president before. At age 39, Frank Sinatra became one of the leaders of a revolution in American cinema. Frank was the teacher of us all. He was part of that modern generation. You know, we were not Americans in that classic style, and the war was over. And all the Americans that were in movies up to that point with crew cuts and uh, T-shirts that said Georgia University and 
played all the good guys, those days were over. The war had changed it all. Nobody knew it, but we did. Sinatra, the irreverent, streetwise, tough guy, fit the times perfectly. By sharp contrast, Peter Lawford, the polite English gentleman, seemed painfully out of date. Peter had a snappy three or four years early in his career. Very early. After that, nothing happened. You know, he'd run from one part to another. You remember those movies. In 1953, It Should Happen to You, starred Lawford in the familiar role of a suave urban bachelor. Where are you going? What is it? Aren't you going to go around Columbus Circle? For what for? <laughs> to see it. It? what this whole date's about. What? What I've got that you want. It Should Happen to You was Peter Lawford's swan song as a leading man. It would be many years before he was asked to work in the movies again. Uh, is it anything? Is what? You and he. Oh, no. Oh, no. Peter Lawford had reached the end of a career that had carried him from abject poverty to the lap of luxury. But just because Hollywood had turned him out didn't mean he had to stop living like a movie star. Peter still had his trump card to play. At age 30, he was one of the world's most eligible bachelors. Thanks to his striking good looks and aristocratic demeanor, rich society girls on both sides of the Atlantic have been nipping at his heels for years. Lawford had always succeeded in staying one step ahead of the pack. Now, he reasoned, it was time to let one of them have a bite. Peter Lawford and Patricia Kennedy announced their engagement at the beginning of 1954. Pat was a member of America's royal family, an heiress to hundreds of millions of dollars. The following spring, they were married in New York City. Outside the church, Lawford's fans mobbed the streets, almost overturning the newlyweds' limousine. Joseph P. Kennedy was reported to have said, the only thing I can imagine that would be worse than having your daughter marry an actor would be having your daughter marry an English actor. Peter Lawford was now the son-in-law of one of the most powerful men in the United States. The same man whose cars he once parked back in Palm Beach during his impoverished teenage years. Peter wasn't aware of it, but the Kennedy family had already decided to cast him in the most important role of his life. There was just one catch. Peter would have to find a way to mend fences with none other than Hollywood's man of the hour, Francis Albert Sinatra. By all accounts, Frank Sinatra was a very caring man. But if you crossed him, as one rat packer put it, he could throw you over the balcony. How could Peter Lawford make amends to a man once his friend who now felt betrayed, a man to whom loyalty meant everything. Tomorrow on Biography, the story continues and the party hits high gear. But as the Rat Pack finds out, politics, crime, and entertainment do not mix. The Rat Pack continues Friday. For Biography, I'm Harry Smith. Good night. To his great dismay, most of the credit for the team's success went to Jerry Lewis.
But now stand by for just a Lewis, a complete workaholic, spent most of his time putting the material together for the act. Disaster in the department store. Hey, buddy, you got a towel? Somebody took mine. I did the editing. I did the writing. It worked. He played golf. Sure, it's Dean Martin. It was easy. It was just easier. If he didn't have to put his mind to work, he didn't. We won't tell Jerry. But if he wanted to come and do what I did, if I wanted to play golf, we could have made the switch and it would have worked. Do you really think so? No. No, no. No, no, no yelling. No, no yelling. To make more room for Lewis's antics, Dean's parts were reduced to brief romantic vignettes. I have a fair idea what you're thinking. Dean's songs were being systematically dropped from the scripts. When Dean would sing in the movie, the kids would get up and go to get popcorn. It took tremendous strength on his part to take a back seat to this idiot. Oh, what would you do without me? What would you do, boy? What would you do without me when I'm gone? Dean found himself being pushed further and further into the background. It was a terrible blow to his pride. Who's always taking it on the chin? Who's always there? Loser win. Who's always been a regular guy? I'll love you till I die. Finally, in the spring of 1954, Dean told Jerry he was splitting. The gossip columns reported that a Martin and Lewis breakup was imminent. Dean had desperately wanted to break away from Lewis, but after taking a good long look at his bank book, Martin got cold feet and backed down. <laughs> to reassure their fans that they were staying together, Martin and Lewis celebrated their eighth anniversary as partners on the Colgate Comedy Hour by recreating their first days together at the 500 Club in Atlantic City. Back then, all television was live. Fearing that the show might run too long, over Dean's objections, Jerry made the decision to cut out one of his songs. But Jerry had miscalculated, and instead, the show wound up running short. Closing the show that night were the Trineas, one of the first great rock and roll bands. When we did the Dean Martin Jerry Lewis uh, show, uh, in, it was in Hollywood, and we were, they ran out of entertainment, more or less numbers, and so they told us to stretch, stretch. And at the end of the show, we started singing, Palm out of soap, palm out of soap. We kept doing that for about five or six minutes, you know. And we did it so long that Jerry Lewis collapsed right into Dean Martin's arm. And Dean Martin says, I told you you should let me sing another song. Dean had caved, but the truce would be short-lived.
His old friend, Skinny D'Amato, had been right. Sinatra was back, and bigger than ever. And in Las Vegas, he was king of the hill. Sinatra never forgot the Vegas bosses who had stuck by him when Hollywood had written him off. It was only fitting that he would now pay them back tenfold. The boys had only to ask, and Frank was there. Sinatra willingly hosted openings of new hotels like the Dunes, freely dispensing his irresistible charm. It seemed almost surreal to see the biggest movie star in the world hawking a Vegas casino perched atop a camel. But Sinatra drank it up. Frank to them was like up here, and they were down here. But in reality, Frank was right down there with them, and that they I don't think they could really grasp that. But Frank never put himself up there. He was always one of the people. And I think being a part of him, just being in the audience with him on the stage, people got thrilled with it. They just wanted to see Sinatra. And I think Frank loved them back as much as they loved him. Maybe they didn't know it, but I think he did. In the carnival atmosphere of Las Vegas, where unbridled excess was celebrated 24 hours a day, every day. Frank could shed the trappings of stardom while being treated like royalty. Here, everyone was in his corner. Rich Americans, draped in mink and dressed in tuxedos, flocked to Las Vegas, eager to see Sinatra. Fat with cash and ready to party, they dropped fortunes at the gaming tables. When Frank Sinatra came into town, the town knew that they were going to be maybe 20 million, 30 million dollars extra to the good, because he would bring in that kind of classy people. As a reward for Sinatra's loyalty, New York mob boss Frank Costello gave him a 9% share of the Sands Hotel. Thus began a partnership between Frank Sinatra and the men who ran Las Vegas that would last well into the 1960s. In the early hours of November 19, 1954, after finishing his last show at the New Frontier in Las Vegas, Sammy Davis set out in his car for a recording session in Los Angeles that afternoon. You know, he was driving down the road and two women coming in the other direction uh, rammed into him. I mean, he fell and hit the uh, post and, and knocked his eye out. Jeff Chandler was the first one at the studio who heard about it, jumped in his car, ran out there. You know, no hospital would take him because he was black and they put him out in a hallway in this other hospital. And that's the, where he was when Jeff Chandler found him, got him into a hospital so they could repair his eye as much as they could. Sammy despaired that his career was over, but his friends refused to let him give up, especially Frank Sinatra. Sinatra drove 70 miles nonstop from Los Angeles to San Bernardino, and brought Sammy to his home in Palm Springs to recuperate. Then Frank did Sammy the biggest favor of his life. He flatly told Davis that if he sat around feeling sorry for himself for too long, he could kiss his career goodbye. Just eight weeks after losing his eye, Sammy climbed onto the stage at Ciro's and played to a packed house. That's when Sinatra Dean and I don't know who else all came on the stage with the patch. And it was marvelous. That night, 
Sammy met a stunningly beautiful blonde actress who was even more self-conscious than he was. Her name was Marilyn Monroe. She was a friend of all of them, you know. But to me, she had an inferiority complex. You know, as gorgeous as she was, you know. But uh, she was very introvert. She was an introvert. Throughout the show business community, Sammy's courage became the stuff of legend, and his popularity soared. Within a year, Sammy Davis was back in Las Vegas for a two-week run at the New Frontier. On opening night, Sammy triumphantly removed his eye patch to a standing ovation. By the time Sammy had finished his performance, the audience was in tears. So we took that patch off and people carried on and cried. This is the history of that eye. And you know, it was a terrible tragedy for everybody. Lucky, well, lucky, unlucky. You know, he was able to see, but that's what happened. And after that, we all hung out together a lot. Uh, Sammy had by that time got connected with Frank. After his accident, Sammy Davis became the younger brother that Frank Sinatra had never had. He christened Sammy Davis. He made Sammy Davis. And when Sammy Davis had problems, he was there with Sammy Davis. Nobody else was there. He was there. Frank Sinatra and the other members of Humphrey Bogart's Rat Pack decided it was high time that Sammy move into the neighborhood. In 1955, Davis took up residence in Judy Garland's old house in the Lily White Hollywood Hills. That same year, he was invited to join the Friars Club. Sammy had the best time in the world. I mean, everybody, we all loved him so much, you know. We, we assumed the guilt of what this country had done to our black brothers, you know. And Sammy would say to us, stop being so nice to me. It's all right. I don't need a girl. I'm okay. Do something about my color, but leave me alone. <laughs> With the love and support of his friends, Sammy Davis had finally made it across the color line and into Hollywood's white aristocracy. He had won a great battle, but the war he would fight for acceptance in a white man's world was far from over. He was diagnosed with throat cancer. Over the next year, Sinatra visited Bogie at his home almost every day. When the end came in 1957, Frank was so devastated that he couldn't bring himself to attend the funeral. Bogart's death, Sinatra became the constant companion of his widow, Lauren Bacall, often taking her to Las Vegas with him. Within a year, Frank and Betty Bacall were engaged to be married, but when Luella Parsons broke the news in her gossip column, Sinatra blamed Bacall for leaking the story and called the whole thing off. In the tradition of Bogart, Sinatra established his own inner circle of close friends and colleagues. Tony Curtis and Janet Lee, Sammy Davis, and Dean and Jeannie Martin 
were being referred to in the press as Frank's Rat Pack. I think it was labeled the Rat Pack. And then once it was labeled that, you know, like fables grow and myths grow, it just became the Rat Pack. We weren't ding-dongs. We weren't guys that show up for the weekend, that was the end of it, you know? But Hedda Hopper loved the idea that we were Rat Packers. And Luella Parsons and Sheila Graham and R Rona Barrett, oh, they quivered at the thought of rats running around in their apartments. <laughs> We never had meetings, and we never had, um, like, bylaws, and, and it was not a group, uh, a, for, a formal, uh, where you sign up or you're asked to join. It wasn't that kind of a thing. It just was a group of people who hung out together. But it was more than that. For the next ten years, Frank Sinatra's Rat Pack was on the cutting edge of everything that was new, fresh, and exciting. For an entire generation, they defined what was hip, in, and groovy. Sinatra had the power to advance or destroy the careers of his Rat Packers. As chairman of the board of his own private empire, Sinatra made the rules and meted out his own brand of justice. You know, there was nobody who was a better pal to you if you, if you were a pal. Frank was a very kind man, you know. We think he was all gruff, and he could, you know, he could throw you out the window and over the balcony, but he was, if you did something to deserve that. But he was a very, very tender guy, very. Kids from Kansas to Pennsylvania soon developed that movie mania. By 1956, Dean Martin had reached the end of the line. After 10 years with Jerry Lewis, Dean wanted out, no matter what the consequences. You in the state of hysteria, watch him flip on the Las Vegas Strip when the boys go crazy at the crap table. 30 to 1 if they roll two ways. Two ways, 30 to 1. Roll them. Come on. Oh, oh, Steve, why'd you faint? When they broke up, the thought around town was that Jerry would be, go on to be, you know, a major personality, and that Dean would fall by the wayside. That's probably him now. Next stop, Rome. Land of Caesars, Michelangelo, and Lola Brigida. And he made one bad picture, 10,000 bedrooms or something like that, and uh, it did not do well. What do you think of our Italian women? The same as I think of all the other women. They're beautiful, wonderful, charming, and I love them. Arthur, I'm in love. That's very nice, sir. I have to marry four girls. That's not a marriage. That's a merger. You, I love. The kind of passion you fashion. Here in a huddle. Explain. It's you. It was a silly movie, you know, um, and I think even Dean thought, you know, I guess uh, they were right. I'm, I'm not so good on my own. But Dean would have better luck with his next movie, a big budget war epic. Cast opposite Marlon Brando and Frank's old buddy Montgomery Cliff, Dean scored a hit in The Young Lions. Dean Martin as Mike, the Broadway wise guy. Maybe why don't we just sit and be quiet? And then what? Then you kiss me. He took off like gangbusters. And I could see the change because we were extremely close at that point with Dean and Gene. And I saw the self-confidence. I saw the man emerge uh, and realize that, yeah, I can do that. Six months later, Dean made his first picture with Frank Sinatra. Dames. The highly charged melodrama 
son came running. As Frank's hard-drinking, fast-living sidekick, Dean was simply acting out his real-life role with Sinatra. What wedding? Wedding? They? Just between you and me, that little old school teacher of yours, you know, she ain't too good an influence. You know, ever since you give up drinking, you've been impossible. Maybe Frank saw himself in Dean. Italian, trying to get started, you know, Frank at that time had been up so high and down so low and then up so high again that maybe he saw something of himself in Dean and wanted to give Dean the assurance that he did have what he had, you know, the confidence uh, uh, that he could do it on his own. He always wears hat in the presence of ladies? All the time. He even sleeps in his hat. I'll bet. I learned a little while back that uh, certain conditions bring a gambler luck, you know? Mm -hmm. And, oh, thank you. And this here hat's one of them. You know, every time I take this hat off, something bad happens to me. All right, come in the door. Frank and Dean's winning combination laid the groundwork for future Rat Pack films. I'm with him. Yeah, I'm with him. Dean was a funny man. You know, in, just in his delivery and his sense of humor, the way he did it, so like it looked like he wasn't, didn't know what he was saying. I mean, and he was hysterical. Dean was special. You know, they used to have a line in, in show business that they said, Frank thought he was God, but Dean knew he was. Back four, with no movie offers on the horizon, Peter Lawford decided to have a go at television. With financial help from his wife, Pat Kennedy, the Lawfords co-produced Dear Phoebe, starring Peter as a newspaper columnist, dispensing advice to the love lawn under a female pen name. Your favorite sports writer and my favorite girl will be here in exactly 12 seconds. How do you know? Power of the mind. In eight seconds, she will burst through those doors, rush to my side, and kiss me. Well, if she does, I'll kiss Humphrey. Oh, the poor innocent bystander always gets the worst of it. Bill, Four, I want to talk three, to you about your two, column for Sunday one, special. Now! A sophisticated sitcom about male and female role reversals. Dear Phoebe was a critical success, but left viewers cold. You are a gentleman and an all-round good sport. Do we throw rice now? Not yet. I merely lost a bet on the fight last night. Hayden versus O'Rourke. The show was canceled at the end of its first season. Do me a favor, Welsh. Maybe your old cologne isn't doing the job for you. Back at his beachfront home in California, Peter Lough had waited for calls from his agent. That never came. He hadn't made a feature film in four years. In 1958, Lawford was back on TV, starring in The Thin Man, a series based on the popular 1930s detective films. An aggressive promotion paid off in moderate ratings, and the show limped into its second year. But early in 1959, Peter received the bad news. NBC would not be renewing The Thin Man. To make matters worse, Lawford was suddenly confronted with a serious dilemma in his personal life. Peter's brother-in-law, John F. Kennedy, was preparing to make his bid for the White House. Joseph P. Kennedy had given his son-in-law the assignment of persuading Frank Sinatra, a lifelong Democrat, to throw his support behind Jack's campaign. Pat Lawford knew all too well that a father's request would be virtually impossible for Peter to fulfill. Sinatra's open animosity towards Lawford was common knowledge in Hollywood. Gary and Rocky Cooper, two of Sinatra's oldest and dearest friends, offered to help Pat Lawford bring Frank and her husband together for a truce. Rocky Cooper was extremely fond of Peter Lawford. 
Confident that a close relationship with Frank could stand the strain, Rocky invited Sinatra and the Lawfords to a dinner party at her home. As it turned out, Peter was held up, rehearsing a television special with Jimmy Durante. And Pat went ahead to the party without him. By the time Lawford arrived at the Coopers, Pat had won Sinatra over, and all was forgiven. One of my favorite people in the world is uh, Pat Kennedy, Pat Kennedy Lawford. I was very close with Pat and Peter when they were married. And she's a wonderful girl. And let's face it, they were charming. Pat was, Pat was really down to earth girl. And I think that to be involved with the Kennedys, to be invited to Martha's Vineyard and st things like that, that's to Frank, even though he was probably the biggest star in the world at the time, I think that is a big added plus. That's another world for him. As if nothing had happened, Lawford and Sinatra picked up where they had left off six years before. Peter confided to Frank that he had bought a script from one of his beach buddies about a platoon of ex-commandos whose captain reunites them to rob the five major Las Vegas casinos. It was called Ocean's Eleven. Frank Sinatra had no trouble making a deal at Warner Brothers to produce Ocean's Eleven. The movie was a guaranteed moneymaker, as well as something Frank had been searching for for a long time. A chance to work with his best pals, Dean and Sammy, and have a blast in their favorite playpen, Las Vegas. As a reward for bringing the script to Sinatra, Peter Lawford received the starring role and a share of the profits. After a six-year absence, Peter was back in the movie business. Late in 1959, Frank Sinatra was on the Warner lot with director Lewis Milestone, working out their plans for the production of Ocean's Eleven, when the Friars Club held a roast in his honor. That night, fortune smiled on a small-time comic named Joey Bishop. They were having a testimonial to Frank Sinatra. And sitting behind a palm, all the way on the other end of this huge table, because every big star in the world was there, was Joey Bishop. Someone didn't show up, and Joey Bishop was invited. Joey Bishop got up last before they presented Frank Sinatra and I never heard such screams from an audience like Joey Bishop about sitting behind the palms, doing this and that. And it endeared him to Sinatra. And Sinatra took him on from there. He says, you got it and you're gonna be a star. And he was. That's as simple as that. One night. Bishop had been working nightclubs as an opening act for 15 years. Yet he was still virtually unknown. There was no record of him before. He was, he was partners with another guy. He, he, it was the Bishop Brothers. That, that, yeah, he was, he was the Bishop Brothers. It was like a vaudeville thing. Joey had opened for Sinatra at the Copacabana back in 1957. But he and Frank were basically strangers to each other. His line at the Copa, when he walked down the steps, he was with Sinatra at the Copa, the place was mobbed. And his opening line was, well, my people are here, when is this gonna show up? And, which at that time was a lot of nerve to say that he was talking about Frank. But they loved it and they laughed. And he really opened the kidding around about Sinatra kind of thing. At 44, Joey Bishop's ship had finally come in, and this time, he wasn't at the airport. Bishop was given a small part in Ocean's Eleven. But Joey's moment of greatness would come on the stage of the Sands Hotel as master of ceremonies to the most famous nightclub act in the history 
of American show business. Everybody eat. In January of 1960, the cast of Ocean's Eleven assembled in Las Vegas to begin shooting. Keep your eye on Danny Ocean. He's the quiet guy in the middle of it all. He's the guy with the big idea. He's calling a summit meeting of his own, and it's going to be a summit to top them all. I got to know all of them pretty well on Ocean's Eleven, even though I wasn't in it much. I hung around a lot. They allowed me to hang around. And Sammy is the one who recommended me for the movie. I was under contract to Warner Brothers, and he said to Frank, you know who'd be a gas as your wife, Angie. Oh, Danny, what a prize you are. The only husband in the world who'd proposition his own wife. Well, I married you once and it didn't work out too well, so what's wrong with a little hey-hey? When Frank did the scene with me, we were in a nightclub, as I remember, and he finished the scene, did the scene and walked off, and kept walking. <laughs> and he said, uh, but maybe we need another one. Good night! <laughs> and that was it. Sinatra wasn't content with just making a movie. Every night after shooting it wrapped, Frank and his crew took the stage at the Sands for a series of shows that would come to be known as The Summit. I was there in Vegas for a couple of weeks. So I saw nine of the shows. I saw them every night that I was there. You're just too marvelous, too marvelous for words, like a glorious, glamorous, and that old standby amorous. It's Frank loved Sammy. Sammy was so special, lively, so funny. I mean, just ain't well enough. You're much, 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 much too much and just too bad. Dean was very quiet and laid back, so when he did speak and say something funny, it was absolutely hysterical. The fat dictionary, I know. Much, 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 much far away from the words in that gun. Much. I'll tell you that marvelous, too marvelous for words. Not yet, Sam, I'll tell you when. Every time it rings, it rings. Like it. It was so exhilarating, and the camaraderie was so wonderful. If I don't sing a song soon, you're going to see some troops on this stage. It was just the most marvelous times of, of just total abandoned fun. They were mischievous, and the shenanigans kept up all the time. See how they're lost without me? I would like for you to meet this man. He represents all the dignity and charm of Ocean's Eleven, Mr. Peter Lawford. Peter Lawford's experience on the Vegas stage was very limited compared to a superstar like Sammy Davis. But the little guy with the big heart went out of his way to make it easier for Peter. By working up a routine they could do together. What am I, your father? I'd like to uh, maybe sing and dance a little, Sam. Peter was very gifted. Peter was, uh, was, you know, adorable. What can you say? Just adorable. The fun they always had was always obvious. I mean, they were always enjoying each other, these five people, especially the four. I don't remember how close Joey was with them. You daffy kid, you're going to be a star. 
Let me see Sonia Henny do something on that. On stage, Joey Bishop suited Frank to a T. But Joey did not indulge in Sinatra's favorite leisure activity, drinking, which, by default, kept him out of Frank's social life. And will you have that ready at 3 o'clock, Doctor? You son of a gun, you spill more than I drink. You know, Frank uh, didn't like it when you didn't live his life. Am I out of the picture? Hey, here's another one of your hit records. Frank was the leader of the pack. There's no question about it. And if he just wanted to hang out with the three of them, and the other person, me included, or Joey, didn't quite fit into their little fun moment, well then why should we be around? Before we get finished, we'll make the town roar. Sinatra had never had a better time in his life. When the show was over, he moved the party to his hotel suite. Bring your sunglasses, Smokey, he tells Sammy because we're going to be watching the sun come up. I would be uh, in on some of those uh, you don't dare go to bed nights. I couldn't pass a physical. It was tough to, to uh, stay with him. Frank liked to go to bed late and sleep late because he was brought up on nightclubs. That was his pattern. And, uh, but the other ones who, who uh, could get away, he could uh, get a little bit of sleep in. He was in complete control of everything. Complete control. Before the show, after the show, and during the show. Sinatra directed, produced, and did everything. Could you walk up to Sinatra and say, hey, Frank, I don't like what you're doing, cut it out. He couldn't do that, but he could tell you. No one but Sinatra could have persuaded the casino bosses to give him unlimited access. Light! Light! How'd it come off? Like a charm. Same here, fantastic. They would work from about 11 to 7 or 8, and then go right to the show. So instead of going out to dinner after work, they did a show. Maybe I'll live a life of regret. Frank Sinatra's Rat Pack had turned the town on its ear. For the next four weeks, there wasn't a single hotel room to be had in all of Las Vegas. I think it was a habit, a wonderful habit that they had of really enjoying the times, even though they didn't know they wouldn't last. Sinatra's Summit at the Sands was the show nobody wanted to miss. Everyone that I know that were there and saw it at the Sands, and we saw the greatest we ever saw. They were making movies in the afternoon, dropping dead at nighttime with their shows. They said, we have never seen anything, it's equal. When Frank put the Rat Pack together, that was the biggest thing in show business. They walk in the building, and, they, and you, the whole atmosphere just changes. You know, it's like people do that. Like they walk into a room or something, and you just feel the whole place come alive. That's the way they were. Oh, Sinatra's here. Pete Martin's here. Peter Lombard. And he always had beautiful girls with him. They were uh, uh, something to see. Let's meet this first gentleman with a great big hand. One of the show's highlights was when Frank, Dean, and Sammy did their impressions. Just a minute. Uh huh. Let me get it straight. You mean all I gotta do is to take the 50 G's while you play parties with a cop? Mm-hmm. Is that right? How about one of these when you're free? Jocko? Yeah, I like 
like to say. They wanted those mistakes, because the mistakes were, 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 were brought them into a, like a whole routine. You ain't late, see. You told me you'd fix my neck. <laughs> and ever since I've been the head of Blair General Hospital, there has been one young man that I keep... Thank you, baby. <laughs> and really... Really one of the great <laughs> people of our time. And here he is. <laughs> Please, do not laugh when I'm doing this. <laughs> Don't laugh, just turn me on. <laughs> here is Cary Grant. Cary, you young whippers. <laughs> Oh, Judy, 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 you can't take a baby out of a man's life and expect him to go on living the way he has been. It's not right and it's not fair. That's all I got. Say. I mean, guys were paying thousand, two thousand. Make sure these were telling me we bought houses on those shows. Houses. Seeing as how we didn't get any dinner, we're gonna get right on. The cocktail cot was a permanent fixture at every show. Well, let's drink up and be somebody. <laughs> Let's drink up and be anybody. I thought that was so cool to take an old-fashioned glass with some ice, pour Jack Daniels in. I'd watch the guys do it. Each one had his own bottle, and we put it down on the table. Drink never hurt nobody. I like the wonderful words of Mr. Joey Lewis. He said, you're not drunk if you can lay on the floor without holding on. Good. Every afternoon. Frank was a bolibus, you know. Frank did a lot of booze, so did Dean. Where you, where you putting that? Everybody hates a smart ass, Frank. Yeah, but everybody loves a lover, I'm though. with you, they, <laughs> they came from a street. How do you learn show business? How do you become a talent from the street? Nothing can stop you. God said, that's you. The Rat Pack's carefully orchestrated routines openly ridiculed prejudice and racism by turning it into a dumb joke. I'd like to thank the NAACP for this wonderful trophy. Like when they told him, say, the NAACP give me this trophy and stuff like that, you know. Uh, it, it was a, f a funny thing to me, you know. But some people look at it, oh, why you let him say that to him, you know. To me, it was funny. So well, I thought since we're all on the same label of reprise, we might Zelda? possibly Zelda. Be able to do so. Hey, also. hey, Zelda, look, Zelda. I'll go out and I'll drink with you. I'll go pick cotton with you. I'll eat oranges with you. I'll go to shul with you, but I don't tax you. I love that show. It was funny as the southern gun to me. Have you forgotten the South? I'm trying to, baby. Yeah. <laughs> I'm out of Bambi Bones. You'll go there by yourself, I know that. <laughs> leader or no leader, I ain't going with you, baby. They're going to come up here to get me. I'll tell you that. They definitely tried to crack to it. I know that for a fact. You know, whatever they could do to help Sammy get through it, because they know they, they hated black. When you have something as powerful as the Rat Pack was at the time, the fact that Sammy was a part of them was at the same time saying the blacks have every right to be a part of this civilization. You know, who knows what the impact was. I think it was very strong. I don't, we'll never be able to measure it. Doesn't like thy game. Sharpies and sparks. Well, go to Harlem. You sure about this guy? I don't know about him. I think he really the African queen, Betty. He must be. That's why this chick is a tramp. 
when Frank said, I won't perform unless Sammy can stay in this hotel too, that was a strong message and it did coincide with the civil rights movement. I am today announcing my candidacy for the presidency of the United States. The Two weeks the after announcing his candidacy for the presidency, John F. Kennedy arrived in Vegas to see the Rat Pack. The brightest man in the political world today, Senator John Kennedy from the great state of Massachusetts. Yeah, John. You follow that, Joey. You son of a gun, you got the Jewish vote. As soon as the filming of Ocean's Eleven had been completed, Sinatra returned to Hollywood, eager to get started on his next project, the election of a president. By the spring of 1960, Sinatra and the Lawfords were as thick as glue. The trio was seen everywhere together and became partners in Sinatra's new restaurant, Puccini's. Before long, Sinatra began recruiting his Hollywood celebrity friends to work for Jack Kennedy. I had kept hearing about Senator Kennedy from Frank Sinatra. And um, he was always saying, you know, boy, he's going to go, he's going to do it. And then Pat Lawford, one night at her house, there was a lovely dinner and everything. And in front of everyone, she said, would you give the opening luncheon to kick off my brother's campaign. And I would, you know, it was such a, a, a out of the blue question for me. And I said, of course. I remember at one point, Janet decided to do a luncheon and all of the wives of the candidates and the Democratic Party were all there. That's just what we would do, you know, at that particular time. And we would do it in a very quiet and unassuming way. Never did anything for publicity. I just wanted to see the Kennedys uh, make it, you know, and what little way I could do, I, I tried. They were all a little afraid of Frank at that time. They weren't afraid of him, but you know, they were afraid of Frank. Frank was a, an outspoken person and, you know, had friends on many, many different layers and levels. No matter how busy he was, once a year, Frank Sinatra made his way back to his old stomping ground, Atlantic City, for his annual engagement at the world-famous 500 Club. Frank never failed to come through for his dearest friend, Skinny D'Amato. First, Skinny paid him to perform, and then he wouldn't charge him anything. But Skinny had to accommodate Sinatra and his entourage, you know, with first-class hotels, food or drinks or cigarettes, whatever they needed. They had this bond. I mean, as I, from what I gather, Sinatra wasn't like a man's man in his youth. So you have this man, he had a presence, Skinny. There's no doubt about that. When he walked into a room where waters parted for him. Skinny D'Amato's reputation as a professional gambler and his association with known underworld figures like Godfather Sam Giancana made him a man to be both feared and respected. Nevertheless, Skinny was one of the best liked guys in town. A man as famous for his generosity as he was for his toughness. In nearby West Virginia, Jack Kennedy was fighting an uphill battle to win the state's Democratic primary. Jack was running far behind in the polls Without a victory here, JFK had almost no chance of receiving his party's nomination. Skinny D'Amato 
arguably one of the most powerful men in Atlantic City, had close contacts with civic and labor leaders from Philadelphia to Miami. As a personal favor to Frank Sinatra, Skinny traveled to West Virginia and made sure that the local officials delivered the votes needed to put Kennedy over the top. In the case of John Kennedy and Skinny D'Amato, the old adage that politics makes strange bedfellows had never been truer. In July, the Democratic Convention was held in Los Angeles. We win, Kennedy! Thanks to the efforts of Frank Sinatra and his friends, John F. Kennedy had become a household name. I want to assure you that today we began here in this city an effort to win this nomination, which I believe will be successful. An impressive number of Hollywood stars came to the L.A. Coliseum to show their support for Jack Kennedy. And now here are some of our friends from the Committee for the Arts of the Democratic National Committee, Mr. Tony Curtis. Mr. Sammy Davis, Jr. Mr. Peter Lawford. Mr. Frank Sinatra. As usual, Sinatra was the man behind the scenes, pulling the strings. Conspicuously absent from the group was Dean Martin, who had flatly refused to campaign for Kennedy. Dean was not uh, close to the um, uh, Lawfords, so perhaps that was the missing link. The Lawfords chose whom they wanted to represent them, the Kennedys, in Hollywood. Actually, um, Sammy wasn't, uh, uh, Davis Jr. wasn't uh, uh, visible um, much in the campaign. Sammy Davis showed up at the convention to sing the national anthem, only to be heckled by the Mississippi delegation. Davis left the arena in tears. Sammy's engagement to Swedish actress Mai Britt had offended millions of white Southern Democrats. See, Sam was like this. I'm a man. I'm a man like any other man. But in those days, I don't care what kind of man you were, if you are a black man, you are in trouble. You know what I mean? Especially if you're around a white girl. Joe Kennedy regarded Sammy Davis as a serious liability to his son's campaign. To Frank Sinatra, Joe Kennedy's attitude was pure hypocrisy. Sammy had asked Sinatra to be his best man, and Frank was not going to disappoint him. But the night before JFK won the nomination, he celebrated with Frank Sinatra at his side. From then on, Sinatra's commitment to Kennedy was absolute, in spite of the conditions that Joe Kennedy put upon it. I think Joe Kennedy was capable of using anybody and everybody. I didn't particularly like the old man. I think he was a user. Jack was so charming, it would be hard to say that he was a user. And Bobby, I think, could have wheeled and dealed with whatever it took to get the job done. And I do believe that they used Frank. Yes, I do. And uh, Frank just wanted to be a part of it. Let me say first that I accept the nomination of the Democratic Party. On the same day that JFK was nominated, Frank Sinatra, his manager Hank Sanicola, Dean Martin, Skinny D'Amato 
applied to the Nevada State Gaming Commission for approval to purchase a controlling interest in Lake Tahoe's Cal Neva Lodge and Casino. The Gaming Commission was not told that there was a fifth silent partner who preferred to remain that way, mob boss Sam Giancana. The previous year, during the U.S. Senate hearings into organized crime, Giancana had been castigated by Robert Kennedy. Uh, would you tell us uh, whether if uh, you have opposition from anybody that you dispose of them by having them stuffed in a trunk? Is that what you do, Mr. Gene Connor? Decline to answer because I honestly believe my answer might tend to include Can you tell us anything about any of your operations? Or you just uh, uh, giggle every time I ask you a question? Decline to answer because I honestly believe my answer might tend to include me. I thought only little girls giggled, Mr. Gene Connor. <laughs> Yet, according to FBI reports, just six months later, Giancana funneled a million dollars in cash from the pension fund of the Teamsters Union into John F. Kennedy's presidential war chest. The money was delivered to the Sands Hotel in Las Vegas the day that JFK arrived there to see the Rat Pack. The reports also claim that a portion of that money was forwarded to Skinny D'Amato to buy the West Virginia primary for Kennedy. Mon Theater in Las Vegas. The Los Angeles Examiner labeled the movie something you should keep your children away from. But the public paid no attention. Ocean's Eleven was a box office smash the ninth biggest grossing movie of the year. The Rat Pack was, hands down, the hottest thing in the country. Jack Warner gave Sinatra the green light to make as many Rat Pack movies as he wanted. But for the moment, Frank's top priority remained getting Jack Kennedy elected president. Sammy Davis Jr. campaigned tirelessly for JFK in the black community and even went so far as to postpone his wedding to my Brit until after the election in November. Still, Joe Kennedy worried that Sammy's association with the campaign would rob his son of key votes in the South. As election day approached, Joe Kennedy's concerns about Sammy Davis proved to be unfounded, but a genuine problem now presented itself. In the final days of the campaign, it became clear that the outcome of the election hinged upon which candidate would carry the state of Illinois, and particularly key districts in the city of Chicago. Joe Kennedy knew that the only hope of his son becoming president was to guarantee a victory there. Determined to win at all costs, Joe Kennedy asked Frank Sinatra to contact his friend, Sam Giancana. Giancana had succeeded Charlie Fischetti as supreme ruler of the Chicago Mafia. He alone had the power to deliver the state of Illinois to JFK. Friendship, yes. There was friendship there. I met Joe Fischetti through Frank, and I met Sam through Frank. And I did not like Sam Giancana at all at the beginning. Wound up absolutely loving him. He's one of the nicest, kindest men I've ever known. Joe Fischetti was a nice man. They loved Frank, and Frank in return loved them. They were friends. Frank was so obsessed with getting Jack Kennedy elected that he didn't think twice about going to Giancana for the biggest favor he would ever ask of him. Frank gave his word to Sam that once JFK was in the White House, he'd order his brother Bobby to call off his crusade against him and his friends. Giancana saw to it that Kennedy got the help he needed. Illinois put John F. Kennedy over the top in an election decided by just over 100,000 votes, the smallest margin in history. And Sam Giancana bragged to his friends 
that he had just gotten a president elected. The following week, Frank and Peter Lawford stood up for Sammy at his wedding to my Brit. The couple received no congratulations from the White House. I would like to take this opportunity to, to thank the American people for being gracious enough to give us the acceptance that they have, me professionally, and the fact that decent people in this country just say they're two human beings and let them live their own lives. And I, 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 we both appreciate that so much. This may be a political question, but did you have any message from the president-elect, John Kennedy? No, I did not. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to say that if we did receive a message from the president-elect, we'd be very thrilled and very honored, of course. Uh, Peter was, uh, stood up with me, along with Frank. Peter Lawford, I mean. Uh, I, if I'm grinning, it must be because I'm so silly happy. <laughs> On January 19th, 1961, the night before JFK took office, Sinatra produced the star-studded gala benefit in Washington, D.C to pay off the Democratic Party's campaign debt. In spite of a record snowstorm, Sinatra raised enough money to put the party back in the black. I think Jack himself called and asked him to do it. And from day one, Frank had complete control of that whole show. But that was Frank's baby, it really was. The lighting, the sound, the orchestra, everything. And the old black magic has me in a spell. Oh, black magic that you weave so well. Because I see fingers up and down my spine. The same old witchcraft when your eyes meet mine. The same old tingle that feel inside. Watch out. I should stay away, but what can I do? I hear your name and I'm a flame. When I flew in the day of rehearsal, I walked on the stage and Frank said to me, where the hell have you been? I said, don't yell at me. <laughs> this is what time rehearsal is called for and I'm here. He could be a, a excuse the expression, a bastard, you know, and, and be really nasty to people. But I, I like that little boy side of him. We haven't had too much rehearsal for the show because of the weather and such. It may be a little ragged, but four years from now, we'll really have it in shape. There was a, a charter plane, and going back for this gala, um, somebody made the crack that if this plane goes down, Hollywood's lost because there was every star from on the West Coast coming east, you know, to D.C. for the gala. Janet, dear, I'm as fond of Luella Parsons and Hedy Hopp as you are, but I do think you ought to read the front page of the newspaper once in a while. <laughs> what my ex-husband Tony Curtis and I did wasn't Shakespeare or Noel Coward, but maybe we didn't have the sense enough not to enjoy it. It only confuses me. Now, now for instance, what is this electoral college I keep reading about? I thought Kennedy went to Harvard. We know exactly the definition of electoral. Janet, will you please tell the people? Electoral is what makes Washington D.C. instead of A.C. <laughs> Isn't she bright? Thank you, Gracie. Uh, Janet. All I could feel was the ebullience and the joy of people seeing us there. Never heard heckling, but then I don't hear too good, so. I still think I was right the first time we tried to get the world's greatest comic, we couldn't get him, and here is Milton Berle. I had the nerve, or chutzpah, if you know what chutzpah means, that means nerve, to say, get this line, dumb line, dumb. Thank you, thank you, Frankie Lane. Thank you, Frankie Lane. I remember that. Oh, Jesus. I know we're all indebted to a great friend, Frank Sinatra. You cannot imagine the work that he has done to make this show a success. 
Tonight, there are two shows on Broadway that are closed down because the members of the cast are here. And I want he and my sister Pat's husband, Peter Lawford, to know that we're all indebted to them and we're proud to have them with us. Those close to Sammy Davis Jr. say that he was either not invited to the gala or told to stay away. It was by far the cruelest snub. Dean Martin was also a no-show at the gala, but he did turn up a week later to appear with Frank and Sammy at a Carnegie Hall fundraiser for Dr. Martin Luther King. After that, politics would be set aside. It was time for the Rat Pack to return to work. 21. Shooting began on the second Rat Pack movie, Sergeants 3, a westernized remake of Gunga Din. Again, Peter Lawford shared the spotlight with Frank, Dean, and Sammy, while Joey Bishop brought up the rear. With Sergeants 3, the Rat Pack scored a second hit at the box office. Life just couldn't get much cooler. The old formula was working, and everything was still swinging. By the summer, Sinatra began seeing a lot of Marilyn Monroe, who had recently divorced playwright Arthur Miller. But Marilyn was at loose ends and emotionally distraught, and Frank had little patience with her. Marilyn Monroe and Peter Lawford were true soulmates who shared a lot of good times and bad habits, like alcohol and drugs. After the election, Sinatra's friendship with John Kennedy had suddenly cooled off. Frank blamed Lawford's reckless lifestyle for Kennedy's cold shoulder. But in truth, Lawford was now one of the president's closest confidants. Peter's beachfront home was a tailor-made location for JFK's secret rendezvous with Marilyn Monroe. Dean Martin had warned Frank years before that the Kennedys would never accept him into their inner circle, but Sinatra had turned a deaf ear. After JFK took office, Robert Kennedy was made Attorney General. Armed with his new power, he resumed his assault on the leaders of organized crime. At the top of his list was the same man who had put his brother in the White House, Sam Giancana. When Sinatra heard that Bobby had placed Sam Giancana under 24-hour FBI surveillance, he was dumbfounded. In February of 1962, Sinatra saw an opportunity to reconnect with JFK after Peter persuaded him to stay at Frank's home in Palm Springs during his upcoming trip to California. He had done a lot of work to it, you know, refurbished a lot of the furniture and the drapes and the rugs. A really a lot of work to make everything absolutely perfect for him. Added on space for the Secret Service people and things like that. Then, a few days before Kennedy was scheduled to arrive, the roof fell in. The FBI found proof of JFK's two-year affair with Judy Campbell, a young actress who had been introduced to him by Frank Sinatra. When Campbell also turned up on FBI surveillance tapes as being the mistress of Sam Giancana, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover delivered the reports to Robert Kennedy in person. JFK never saw Judy Campbell again. He immediately canceled his visit to Sinatra's house. Peter Lawford was handed the task of conveying the bad news to Frank. For being the bearer of bad news, Sinatra would make Peter pay dearly. 
In a fury, Sinatra swiftly ousted Peter from his clan. This time, their friendship was over, permanently. Well, you always have to have somebody to blame, and it was poor Peter in that respect, but I don't know. I think maybe through the years, Frank might have realized it wasn't Peter, because Peter adored Frank. He would have done anything in the world for him. In May, Lawford delivered Marilyn Monroe to Madison Square Garden to appear at JFK's 45th birthday bash. Mr. President, the late Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn had walked off a picture she was making with Dean Martin in Hollywood, even after the studio forbade her to make the trip. When she returned, she was fired. Marilyn had been intimately involved with both Jack and Robert Kennedy, and nearly went insane after being rejected by them. To add fuel to the fire, her addiction to barbiturates was spinning out of control. In July of 1962, the Lawfords brought Marilyn to join Frank Sinatra at the Cal Naval Lodge for some fun and games. Sinatra had agreed to put up with Lawford for the weekend because Monroe was falling apart. Frank hoped that Marilyn could pull herself back from the brink, but it was not to be. Six days later, she committed suicide at her home in Los Angeles. Peter Lawford would carry the guilt of her death for the rest of his life. Peter was a very disillusioned and very uh, bitter person. And I think that's what, that bitterness at an early age, you know, bitterness at an early age automatically turns into alcohol, substance abuse, uh, all kinds of addictions, you know? And that's what I think happened with Peter. Two weeks after Marilyn was laid to rest, Dean Martin and his Italian friend appeared at Skinny D'Amato's 500 Club in Atlantic City. Sammy flew into town to join them for the last show. For Sinatra, the past had always held a special place in his heart. Now, once again, he decided to reach back to try to regain a lost love. In the summer of 1963, Frank and Ava Gardner reunited. It wasn't long before the fireworks started. The reconciliation ended after a typical blowout. Sinatra headed west, back to Nevada, where more trouble was waiting for him. The FBI had notified the Gaming Commission that Sam Giancana, one of America's 10 most notorious criminals, had been staying at Sinatra's Cal Naval Lodge in direct violation of Nevada state law. The incident wound up costing Frank Sinatra his gaming license. On October 10, 1963, Sinatra was forced to give up his ownership of Cal Neva, as well as his 9% interest in the Sands Hotel. Skinny D'Amato and Sam Giancana both lost a fortune. Through the form, Dean Martin was again ahead of the curve and had sold his share the year before. Frank traded his casino shares for Warner Brothers stock and went to work on his third Rat Pack movie, Robin and the Seven Hoods, a fairy tale of the Chicago mobs of the 1920s that portrayed them as lovable Damon Runyon characters. Dean Martin is Little John. Sammy Davis Jr. is Will Scarlet. Frank Sinatra is Robin. What's your record? Brain surgeon. No one I know gets so such a glow out of bang, bang, like me. My kind of town. Chicago. My kind of town. Chicago. On November 22, 1963, Robin and the Seven Hoods 
was shooting a funeral scene on a Warner Brothers lot when JFK was assassinated in Dallas. For Peter Lawford, it was the beginning of the end. In a world that had always overwhelmed him, this was the final crushing blow. I think when the president was killed, it really did him in. Uh, I don't think Peter was never the same. I just, for some reason, he just lost it. Two weeks after JFK was killed, Sinatra was caught up in the worst nightmare of his life. His only son, Frank Jr., was kidnapped and held for ransom. The only thing that I do remember that really hurt Sam Giancana was when Frank Jr. was kidnapped and Sam reached out to help, and I happened to be with him the night it happened. And Sam reached out to help Frank, and Frank wouldn't even come to the telephone and take his call. And he said he didn't need any help. And that was the end of uh, their relationship. Their friendship stopped almost right there. In less than two years, all of Frank Sinatra's high hopes had been dashed, as he had so many times before. Frank picked himself up and moved on. For the once inseparable Rat Pack had already lost two of its members. One way or another, Frank, Dean, and Sammy still found ways to work together. Shot me, it don't mean a thing. If it ain't that, that's way basic. Has anyone seen my throat spray? How was, the, uh, how was the audio for you? Could you hear yourself? No, not at all. I know that. Well, that's just that kind of a room. In 1965, they traveled to St. Louis to recreate the Las Vegas Summit Show for Sinatra's favorite charity. Everyone there was here. Chicky go, chicky go, chicky go. I gotta warm up. What are you gonna warm up? <laughs> there it is. I How's your read tonight, Daddy? <laughs> After more than 20 years on the boards, Frank had managed to hang on to his two best friends. Sing it again, I didn't hear it. <laughs> well, how many more you think he's gonna do, Sam? I don't know, but he sure sing good for a white fella, don't he? <laughs> you make me feel so young. You make me feel like spring has sprung Every time I see you grin I'm such a happy individual The old songs seem to be from another time. The old jokes, all too familiar. I'd like to thank the NAACP for this wonderful trophy. Put me down! But the classic style, the unmistakable magic, was still there. Mr. Chairman! No, not here, no, not here. No, that's for another four years. You dirty rat. All you want me to do is take the 50 Gs while you play parties with the cops. Is that so? You did it to my brother in the back. I'm gonna do it to you. All right, <laughs> I'd like to do one that nobody can do. Yeah, now what one is that? That what one is that? Yeah. <laughs> Hey, you step on my swage one more time. They had done these same bits hundreds of times, yet they still seem to take a special delight in them. Maybe it was simply the joy they took from each other. Yeah, how are we going to do If all the women in Texas were as ugly as your mama, the Lone Ranger going to be alone for a long time. Sinatra was now 50 but still the inexhaustible chaser of good times. Everywhere he went, his friends went too. We gave each other the pie. But the first one that Sammy got, I never saw a guy do a take like this. He got it from the wrong side with the bad glimmer. It came like this. And he stood like this. He didn't know what happened to him. And he had white pie, this side. This was all the hard. No, he thought he was going to get a face on. And he kept looking with the good glimmer, see? But he didn't know it was coming away like this. Deep in his heart, Sinatra knew that the party was over. 
1971, he said goodbye and officially retired. It doesn't matter how great Sammy was, and Sammy was one of the greatest performers ever to come along, that we'll ever see, and a wonderful person. Dean was a wonderful person. Uh, Peter was great. Joey is one of the funniest men. And yet, the one, the, the real phenomenon of them all is Frank, and you just can't help. He is an extraordinary uh, persona. He's just, you can't talk enough about him, and yet you can never define him. I mean, that's the elusive magic. Call me irresponsible. Call me unreliable. Try and undependable too. I just adore you. Call me unpredictable. Tell me I'm impractical. Rainbows I'm inclined to pursue. 